Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me well and clear. Um, so great to see you all here. Many, many familiar faces, uh, some new faces. Uh, this is going to be a fantastic event. We've been looking forward to it a long time, working towards it for a long time. Uh, my name is Jan Neyman. I'm the director of the Urban Studies Institute at Georgia State. Um, welcome to Atlanta. Welcome to Georgia State University. Uh, I hope you're ready for a little bit of courtroom drama. Uh, you know, we are, we are good friends with the law school and some of our affiliate faculties in the law school, and, and we were able to borrow this venue uh, for these two days. Now you know what it feels like to be Michael Cohen when you sit, <laughs> sit up here. Uh, so, you know, the first order of the day, uh, and a real pleasure for me, is to introduce our provost uh, at Georgia State University, Risa Palm, uh, without whom this event would not have happened. Uh, she's an urban geographer, uh, well known for her work in hazards, uh, the urban impact of natural hazards, uh, and more recently, especially her work on the urban impacts of global climate change. She's been a terrific supporter uh, of this event and of the Institute. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about the Institute later on, but please first welcome Risa Palm. Thank you. You know, when um, presidents are provosts, and we, we're called upon all the time to welcome people to places, you, you can't believe the kinds of welcomes I've had to give where I can't pronounce the name of the, the event that's going on, or I have no idea what they're doing. But I'm really excited to welcome you to this event. This is really exciting to have you here. Um, I just want to say two things quickly. First of all, um, the reason that the university that Georgia State University is excited about this event and about the Urban Studies Institute is that it really is part of what we feel to be our strategic plan, or what is our strategic plan. Um, part of what we wanted to do was to globalize the university to establish deep partnerships with particular partner universities. Um, and then also another part of the strategic plan was to try to understand the complexities of urban areas since we are in a complex urban area. Um, this meeting and this series of meetings really originated in some conversations with at least one of you that's in this audience. I mean, we were trying to think about collaboration uh, with Hong Kong, especially Hong Kong Baptist University and Adrian Bailey with South Africa, um, with, I, I won't say whatever university he was in, but Alan Mabin, whatever university, yes, Alan, um, the various universities, and, and trying to think about what would come of looking at cities from an eastern, from a southern, from a, from a variety of, of points of view, what, what could we learn from that? And the issue really is one of collaboration. Collaboration, I think, is something, and I know that there are some titles here that are saying collaboration is silly, but at any rate, I hope that they don't really mean that. That collaboration uh, really does yield um, ideas, uh, new ideas about um, urban issues. Um, when I think back to the olden days in the United States in urban studies and urban geography, um, certainly urban geography was coming from urban sociology and that was coming from Chicago and everything was Chicago. So you could do a, can you believe it, a factorial ecology of Calcutta. A member of the National Academy of Sciences did such a thing. I don't, I don't know if you factorial ecology, but at any rate, um, so the, the notion was you could take Chicago and try to replicate Chicago everywhere. And then the next step was, since not everybody was at Chicago, somewhere at Iowa, somewhere at Ohio State, that you could look at Midwestern cities and you could talk about something called an isotropic plane. Now, I'm from a Midwestern city, and I can see why you might think of it as an isotropic plane. But um, that was the, the, the attempt attempt to get this theory out of something that's quite rich, and it's not the notion of theorizing to that level. Um, then we had the paradigmatic city, right? I'm not sure how you pronounce that word, by the way, that Michael Deere came up with. It was called Los Angeles, and that would be the paradigmatic city. Now, did you notice they're all American cities? Uh, so uh, a great deal of, 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 of it, I'm sorry, U.S. cities, not American cities, U.S. cities. Um, 
I think that, that um, looking at cities more generally, looking at urban issues more generally, has been very, very important. And it's important to have an interplay between understanding what we're looking at and how it is that we're looking at it. In other words, the theory. The theory can often, some, well, sometimes be much too general, or it can be much too specific. And it's very important to look at how things have actually evolved. If we think of Atlanta, for example, without Maynard Jackson, we would be Birmingham. And if you don't know what I mean by that, that's something to actually look into. It has nothing to do with isotropic planes, and it has nothing to do with Marxist theory. It, it's very important to look at what has happened in particular places and, and how, how places uh, come to be. Um, so um, cities have a great deal in common, and they have a, a great deal that are, that are different from one another. Cities may be the products of former colonies, and then you think about, well, whose colonies? When colonies? What colonies? What are we talking about? Um, they, they may be the product of where they are, relatively isolated, relatively less isolated, relatively in hazardous areas, less hazardous areas. Um, there may be overwhelming political issues that have dominated the development of cities or religious issues that have dominated the development of cities. What I think about right now, and I know you're having a session on smart cities, but I, what I'm thinking is going beyond that. What we're looking at now is this incredible pace of development of artificial intelligence. And that does translate into smart cities, but it goes way beyond that, way beyond that. So what our deans have been thinking about, I think, is the ideas of technological singularity and what that would mean for human beings and what that means for settlement. And I'm worried that we're not quite there with what we're, what we're doing in, in our studies right now. But at any rate, that, that's what um, I worry about and I hope I'm wrong. My hope is that this meeting is not just a series of presentations. Certainly when you get into a courtroom like this, it looks like it will be. But that it really, really is the basis of not only questions, but collaborations that last beyond the meeting. That really is our goal for you. So again, welcome. Welcome to Atlanta. The weather's going to get better. Welcome to Atlanta. Welcome to this conference. And should I introduce? Um, our wonderful colleague, <laughs> Dean Sally Wallace. Uh, Sally is uh, an economist who studies what makes cities work from the point of view of, is there money there? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sally is the dean of the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies. Sally? Yeah, sometimes I get the wet blanket title. You know, I have to talk about taxes and I'm an economist, so two strikes against me. But um, I, I thank you, Risa, for that kind introduction and also for setting the stage for how important this conference is, but also how important the work of urban studies and the Urban Studies Institute at Georgia State University is as well. I want to extend my heartfelt welcome to all of you and just tell you a little bit of a commercial about our school and the Urban Studies Institute and wish you well in, in this conference. The Andrew Young School of Policy Studies is a very, very dynamic place where theory, evidence, and data are brought together in a thoughtful way to inform policy and practice for the next generation. Risa talked about this concept of singularity and where we think our worlds are heading. Um, and it's, it, on one level, a little bit scary, but on another level, just incredibly exciting. But one of the things that the, the deans think about as we sit and scratch our heads is, how are our, our students going to get jobs? And what are those jobs going to look like in this new world? Um, the, the notion of, of cities and, and comparative urbanism, I think, can bring an awful lot to our understanding of how we best tool up our students and get them ready for this, this brave new world. If you look around us, I think it's, it's very obvious that we're all witnessing tremendous changes in, in the landscape in which we research and teach and, and work. As, as Risa said, artificial intelligence is, is here. Anybody who thinks it's not um, is, is really missing the boat. On top of that, or with that, we have 
data and big data, more data than we have ever seen before. Um, and that's been something that's, that's grown over the last couple of decades. But still, we're sort of at that place scratching our heads. How do we use it? How do we best use it for um, informing policy and practice? How do we infuse it in our research and our teaching? And, and, it's, and it's tremendously important. We also have probably, maybe as a result of some of the technology changes, we have increasing income disparities, we have issues with housing affordability, kind of the, the cracks in the system that have come along with this fourth industrial revolution of, of technology and artificial intelligence. And I'm really happy to see all of you here helping us figure out how to deal with those issues going forward. Putting, putting the ideas of artificial intelligence, data, technology, and, and those kinds of technological changes, people have struggled with, how, how do you refer to them? Um, in the Andrew Young School, we're talking about them under the umbrella of the new digital age and figuring out the way forward for research, teaching, policy, and practice in that new digital age. The Andrew Young School is really at the center of developing and harnessing those concepts um, among policy schools, so we're very, very pleased and proud of the work that we're doing within the school. The Urban Studies Institute that has brought you here is one of the newest jewels for the Andrew Young School and for Georgia State University, focusing on economic resilience, inclusive development, and environmental urbanism. They are going to help us lead the way in a very comparative prospect for figuring out the role of cities and where cities are headed for the future. Um, I'd like to once again shout out to Risa Palm and thank her for her support and her vision in putting the Urban Studies Institute together. So my short welcome and, and wish for you is that you enjoy your time in Atlanta, that you help us figure out where we're headed on some of these problems, and I hope that this is just the beginning of a very <coughs> vibrant and long-standing relationship that we all have. So, so welcome and have a great time while you're here. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Wallace, and thank you, Provost Palm, uh, for your support for the Institute and for this conference. So the theme of the conference is comparative urbanism global perspectives. Um, you know, about 20 years ago, almost, I, I gave a talk at IIT Mumbai, and I don't remember exactly, exactly what the topic was that I, I spoke on, but it had something to do uh, with Mumbai. It had something to do at the time with the changing... Uh, land values in that city and foreign investments coming in and so on. And I got a question from the audience, from one of the graduate students, uh, along the lines, since I had made reference in passing to world city uh, hierarchies and world city rankings, and the question was, where does Mumbai rank? And I'll never forget that moment because it was an awkward moment, because um, it didn't rank anywhere in those rankings at the time. And uh, so it was a bit of an uncomfortable moment. I don't remember exactly how I got out of it. Uh, but the response very clearly was, the gist of the response was, if we don't rank anywhere, clearly there's something wrong with your theory uh, about this. And, uh, you know, if, if, if Mumbai is a city that is the leading economic metropolis of one-sixth of humanity, clearly something is wrong. With that, something is missing. And I, I've never forgotten that moment. Uh, so this was around the same time that the, the first calls on comparative urban studies and comparative urbanism uh, started to float around. And I think, uh, I think Risa, you might mention of Michael Deere, uh, did you? Uh, I think he was actually one of the first ones when writing about the LA school and to be fair, you know, it's often been, in hindsight, also dismissed the LA School for being so fixated on LA that there was a, a real claim, a real push, trying to go for a comparative global urban studies. Uh, and so that field evolved uh, over, the, over the following years. And later on, when I was teaching my grad students at the University of Amsterdam, I was reminded of that incident again when my graduate students in Amsterdam complained about the theoretical literature that was so US centric and that didn't apply to what was going on in Amsterdam. And, and so there have been real signs, and I'm sure you have 
had those kinds of experiences yourself of this decentering of of theory in urban studies. Uh, the goal of this conference is really to, to take this a step further. The, the literature on comparative urbanism, I think, has stalled uh, to some degree. And to some extent, it has evolved. In, it has morphed into a standoff between universalizing theory from the north, predominantly, and urbanism from the global south. And so what, what results from that is sort of an exceptionalist argument on part of cities from the global south. One of the things that we try to do in this conference when we were thinking about putting it together is to bring in the global east to shake up this, this standoff. Um, the, a global east that certainly doesn't fit either of these narratives, either of these perspectives of north or south. The very you know, construct of these categories is, is questionable too. You know, we're, we're quite aware of that. Uh, and, and a number of you are geographers, and we have this natural tendency to also group these cities spatially and geographically, as we probably should. But it's not said at all that we can really identify these three categories as spatial containers, let us say. It's more a way, it's a vehicle to, to think about it uh, and a vehicle to discuss the issues at hand. Now, we have, I think, a fantastic series of, of papers and sessions in this conference, and we certainly have diversity uh, when it comes to the empirical foci of the different uh, papers. And I was just glancing through the, the program. So together, we we represent empirical work on cities in the United States, Australia, the Netherlands, Russia, the UK, China, Spain, Taiwan, Canada, Dubai, South Africa, Brazil, Ethiopia, Senegal, India, Chile, South Korea, Morocco, Nigeria, Argentina, Singapore, Japan, Samoa, and New Zealand. That's pretty good for the relatively small group that we have here. Then I thought I should also look at where the voices come from in this conference, because part of the debate is not just where the empirical focus lies, but who's doing the talking, and from where that talking originates. Uh, and so the voices come from cities in China, the US, Russia, Brazil, India, Australia, Canada, the ne Netherlands, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, South Africa, the UK, Morocco, Colombia, Poland, and France. That's a much shorter list. And it does reflect, I think, a, an ongoing tendency of comparative urbanism as a problematic seized upon by folks from the north. Uh, not entirely, but, uh, but, it's, uh, but disproportionately so. Well, so, so the, the situation in the theoretical debates on, on comparative urbanism are to some extent characterized by this standoff between uh, universalizing theory or planetary urbanization to some degree um, versus provincial or provincialized urbanism. And we wanted to shake it up by bringing in the global east uh, as another category, as another way of looking at it. And we have a wonderful first keynote speaker. Uh, we have three wonderful keynote speakers uh, in, in the conference, but the first one, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce him, is George Lin uh, from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he got his PhD at the uh, University of British Columbia, uh, but his most of his education before that was in China, and he's, again, uh, he has been with the University of Hong Kong for a long time as chair of the Department of Geography, as associate dean, and now he's fully back into research mode uh, in the Department of Geography. Uh, I had the great pleasure of, of meeting with George, I, maybe it's 12 years ago or 14 years ago, it all tends to become a blur, uh, a private excursion in Hong Kong, if, if you remember that, and that was, that was really wonderful, and I had the opportunity to return the favor in Amsterdam about six or seven or eight years ago. Uh, so I'm really pleased to have you here, George. Uh, his, his book on red capitalism, you know, this was from 1997, I believe, 
was a fantastic book, is a fantastic book, you know, because it was, I think, path-breaking in looking at the effects of uh, state capitalism, if you will, on the evolution of cities and, and on the Pearl River Delta in particular. So it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome George Lynn. Um, first of all, thank you, Yang, for giving me the great honor and opportunity. I would also like to thank uh, Provost uh, Palm and being a uh, for your great support. Without your support, it's not possible for all of us to come together. Uh, when I was contacted by Yang, I think quite a long time ago, uh, about uh, the possibility of coming to join this conference, uh, I Im immediately looked at my <laughs> academic calendar and it was a great delight to me that you have chosen the best time, as far as uh, I am concerned. It happens to be the reading week of the university. And obviously, this uh, timing also suits all of you who are sitting here. Um, there is a Chinese popular saying that uh, we have traveled a thousand miles for a meeting because we are brought together by our common fortune. Uh, obviously, this is a common fortune, uh, our common fortune, our common interest in global comparative urbanism. So uh, it's a great pleasure. And uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, I'm going to, uh, first of all, to uh, situate um, uh, China's uh, urban, the growth and speciality of urbanism in China, uh, hopefully in, in a global context. Uh, I will then elaborate uh, on two uh, important uh, driving forces uh, that I believe to uh, be powerfully reshaping uh, Chinese urban landscape. Uh, and then I'll close with a few remarks, uh, particularly to raise a number of issues or questions for us uh, to think about, given that this is the beginning of the conference. Um, well. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is that better? Good. And then we can use the mouth. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I think that uh, from my point of view, um, this conference is really held uh, at the right moment in time when we are witnessing um, profound changes in three important dimensions. Um, including namely the, the repositioning of regional economy in, in the global economy. Uh, this is a graph that I borrow from the World Bank and it illustrates the repositioning of regional economy in uh, East Asia, uh, Western Europe. I hope that you can see that, all right. And then uh, the yellow curve represents uh, repositioning of North America. So you can see that if we, you know, these are data that are to be believed, uh, obviously the world's economy uh, has been changing quite significantly. It is also um, a historical moment when human race, uh, for the first time, has shifted our, uh, the center of uh, uh, settlements from the rural area uh, to the urban area. Um, the center of gravity in human settlements in urbanization has also been shifted from the uh, advanced economy to the less advanced economy in which the global south and the, the global east uh, are considered to be a part. Uh, and finally, uh, this is also an interesting moment when um, competing interpretation uh, and theorization of uh, global urbanism uh, has also experienced some uh, significant uh, changes. Uh, at the risk of oversimplification, uh, I think that we have seen uh, a great uh, diversity of theoretical attempts uh, to make sense of uh, global urbanism. You have the convention of the notion of the agglomeration econom uh, economies. You have the liberal interpretation that uh, take cities as the important arena 
in which um, neoliberalism uh, operates, and you ha also have the Marxist interpretation that takes cities as the uh, symbolic investment or consumption space for the surplus value uh, uh, generated um, um, for the state and for the ruling class. And then you have the interpretation from my honorable uh, uh, colleagues about uh, the model coming uh, from the global south. And finally, uh, I think that this is uh, the new direction that all of us are working together to see whether there is a, an uh, independent and an alternative path uh, to make sense of what we have observed. Um, now, a critical reflection of uh, what has been produced has led me to um, observe a number of tensions. Uh, first of all, um, when we uh, engage in theorization and interpretation and understanding of the growth and speciali speciality of global urbanism, I think that our attention tends to be paid immediately on the horizontal and global scale. And we tend to downplay vertical and local scale. Uh, when we look at the notion of agglomeration economies, uh, a lot has been written on the effect, and less has been written on the origin, particularly the social political origin. Uh, if you take a look at neoliberalism, uh, the foundation uh, there basically was built upon the perceived interaction of state and markets, you know, the hollowing out of the states, the triumph of the market, uh, and uh, we tend to um, um, uh, be relatively uh, silent when we come to the relationship between state and society that I'm going to demonstrate to you that is play a very, very important role as far as the global East is concerned. Finally, if we take a look at uh, place and space, despite competing attempts to re-theorize place and space, I think that there is still a tendency to take place as the backdrop, the context, and then space as the container. There is also ongoing uh, tension between epistemology and ontology. Uh, and again, I wonder whether a uh, study of global urbanism uh, in, in the East could also offer a, a path uh, to resolve that tension. So what I'm interested in uh, is um, the actual experiences in China and to see whether or not there is um, an alternative path to lead to a, so that this tension uh, that we observe could be reconciled. Um, now, uh, this is uh, a graph to uh, perhaps to give you an idea about uh, the growth of industrialization and urbanization in China over the past 70 years. All right? uh, the upper curve represents the level of industrialization as measured by the percentage of industrial output in the total social output. Uh, the lower curve represents the Chinese definition of urbanization. Uh, the percentage of urban population in total population, you can see that before 1978, what you had in China basically was what has been categorized as industrialization without urbanization. It was only after 1978, as a result of market reform and opening up, that urbanization started uh, to take off. And particularly after the mid-1990s, obviously urbanization has been on an accelerated um, uh, path. This is uh, a graph that I have created to give you an overview of China's changing urban system. Again, if you take a look at 1978 as uh, perhaps a historical watershed, after that, the, the bottom, the bottom uh, panel represents small cities. Those that are identified at the top represent large and super large cities. You can see that First of all, after 1978, there is a steady increase of urban settlement. Secondary, if we take a look at the changing uh, restructuring, 1995, the mid-1990s, function as an important turning point. Between 1978 and 1995, what you have in China is what could be uh, categorized as an urbanization from below. Yeah? Yeah, you have, it's driven by the rapid growth of small cities in the bottom. 
If you take a look at the top, there's very little, a uh, few changes at the top. After 1995, you can see that there's the actually decline uh, in number of small cities in the bottom, and what you have is the emergence of large and super large cities. They come back to resume their leadership. Um, when we talk about cities in China, uh, until very recently, cities in China uh, were the socialist cities, similar to the former Soviet Union, Eastern European countries, with an interesting landscape and urban morphology that are significantly different from what we observe from the West. Now, this is a landscape that has been categorized as what? Uniformity, standardization of housing, the shortage of CBD, uh, social city, there's no CBD. Uh, you have um, tighten control on population size. You have the state units, you know, the Dangwei. Uh, and, and also you have a lower level of stratification uh, inside the cities. So that is to you know, reflect your memory of what a socialist city looks like. That urban landscape in recent years has experienced profound changes. So this is uh, changes in urban landscape in Beijing, changes in urban landscape in Wuhan, my uh, colleagues uh, Ling uh, Li Zigang uh, comes from Wuhan. Uh, changes in urban landscape in Guangzhou. Uh, so, you know, you can just take a look at, just to give you an image of before and after. My interest then is, so how do we make sense of this restructuring and profound, profound changes of the urban landscape observable in many Chinese cities today? Uh, to do that, I um, did uh, two uh, case studies, uh, starting with the south in Guangzhou and then moving to the north, and kind of the northern uh, expedition from the south. Uh, I started with uh, a, study, uh, a case study of, of Guangzhou that I'm more familiar with. Uh, Guangzhou, uh, for many, many years, functioned as China's gateway to global urbanism. Uh, in the first decade, uh, in the first two decades of market reforms and opening up, primarily in the 1980s and 19, uh, 1990s, Guangzhou continues to uh, experience, first of all, rural industrialization and urbanization initially, and then since the 1990s, dramatic urban expansion or urban sprawls. Um, in recent years, continuing urban expansion has reached its limit because of stronger institutional control from above and growing resistance of farmers toward land grabbing below. Concern with the national interest in food security, uh, social stability, the central authority under the new president, uh, presidentship of Xi Jinping uh, chair a special uh, meeting uh, in 1913 uh, placing a uh, limit on the expansion of large cities with a population of 5 million or above. So it's no longer possible to engage in urban expansion because of this uh, control uh, from above. And meanwhile, farmers have become increasingly better informed of the value of their land, making it difficult for municipal governments to continue to take land from the countryside. So the combined inter, uh, 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 combination of forces from above and below uh, forced the municipal government in Guangzhou to shift its emphasis from urban expansion to uh, urban renewal. Uh, and the, uh, the approach adopted was to redevelop what the Chinese called the three O's, namely all factory, all neighborhoods, and all villages in the cities. Uh, this is uh, uh, the map showing the, uh, the distribution of the three O's identified by the municipal government. Um, now, internationally, we're, we're all aware of the difficulties uh, in projects, pushing projects of urban renewal. Uh, urban renewal must necessarily be contentious and difficult 
uh, because it involves the interests of existing land users. Uh, so the same applies to China. Existing land users would not cooperate unless they are given strong enough incentive uh, to cooperate with the uh, attempt of urban redevelopment. This means a reformulation of the relationship between the state as landowner on the one hand and existing land user, part of the society on the other. So what I was interested in was to take a look at how this relationship between the state and society got reformulated to make it work, to make you know, urban redevelopment tick. Uh, and what the municipality in Guangzhou has done is to do two things. Number one, profit concession. Originally, the net profit from land development in the form of land conveyance income uh, is supposed to be remitted to the state 100%. Nothing was shared with existing land users. This has been reformed. 60% of the net profit will now be returned to the existing land user so that they are motivated. 40% will be remitted to the, to the state as the original owners of land first. Secondary is power decentralization. Municipal government only control in distance by setting guidelines through land use zoning and land use intensity. You don't want things to be out of control. So how do you maintain control of land redevelopment? You, first of all, you set the purpose of use, land zoning. Secondly, you don't want it to be too in intensive. So we control land use intensity. Other than that, decision making has been decentralized to locality. So two important attempts and measures have been, have been adopted to make it work. Um, I identify two uh, villages that are located in the center of the city. These are two villages that are standing side by side. But what is interesting is one turned out to be acceptable, a great success, the other turned out to be the failure. So in contrast to the theory of location, uh, agglomeration, economy, so on and so forth, I was curious about, so what really explains the success and failure of urban redevelopment? And my research suggested that although these two cases are located together, side by side, but they are different in terms of the approach, including the extent of the concession of the income previously monopolized by the state, the way in which decision making uh, uh, were, uh, were introduced, and then uh, the timing and expense for developers to be involved, and then finally, but most importantly, linear structure of the villages. It is uh, the differences in these four important factors, and you can see that it all relate nothing with the operation of market forces and location. You know. Rather, it has a whole lot to do with the relationship between state and society. Um, so you know, this is to give you an image of before and after. Uh, this is to give you an image about the uh, disputes uh, happen in the other villages. Now, in the interest of time, let me quickly return to the second case, moving from the south to the north. That is to look at Beijing. Um, uh, in recent years, as a result of uh, intensive uh, praise competition, uh, one of the important uh, 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 approaches adopted by Chinese municipal governments to uh, foster the growth of urbanism uh, has been the hosting of mega events. Um, the mayor and party secretary of a Chinese munici muni municipality face a constant challenge to maintain high economic growth to make sure that it's not going to go down. And I think that the same could be applied even to the central leadership. So what you have is you try to host mega event as an attempt to delay economic recession, to make sure that 
it, it could carry on as far as possible. Uh, this is a conceptual uh, 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 image uh, to demonstrate that without hosting the macro event, most likely the economy will drop. By hosting macro event, you make sure that it's not going to drop dramatically. You delay the decline as far as possible of urban economic growth. All right, so that is you know, the, 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 the thinking that I, I got after you know, doing interview and talking with Chinese uh, mun uh, municipal uh, authority. So that's the 2008 Beijing Olympic. Uh, very quickly, um, this is a graph to illustrate uh, what happened between the time when Beijing was confirmed, announced to be the host of the 2008 Olympic. Okay, the announcement was made in July 2001. All right, the actual event was held obviously in 2008. So what I look at was what happened during this period of time, between the time when it was announced and the time when the event was actually held. So this is what happened. This illustrates the dramatic increase of land sale. You are using hosting macro event as a justification for accelerating land sale to generate a higher income. You remove uh, all of the um, unnecessary uh, uh, industrial activities, uh, uh, run down neighborhoods. Uh, uh, now, without hosting the macro event, uh, this effort will meet strong social resistance. But using this hosting macro event as a justification, you know, you effectively pursue your interest uh, of, of, of land finance. This is a graph to illustrate the increase of land development permits during this period of time, the expansion uh, of the uh, urban built-up area, uh, and as I mentioned, it used that as a uh, powerful justification to remove Many of the state-owned enterprises, as I said, Chinese cities were socialist cities, and socialist cities were characterized by the location of many state-owned industries that tend to occupy central location in the cities. So removing this state-owned industry will make sure that the valuable land will become available for more high-value added. Uh, real estate and commercial development, right? So this is a graph to illustrate the removal of state-owned enterprises. Yet, yeah, interestingly enough, the growth of GDP happens to be short-lived. Yeah? Yeah? It's during the period, of, you know, the period of time when you are making preparation for the Olympic, it actually, yeah, it, it, it did increase, but it did not last long. Um, environmental pollution, uh, the improvement of air quality, again, it was significant, but it did not last long. So that gives right to the notion of the so-called Beijing blue, that you see the blue sky because of hosting the Olympic, but it's solid. Um, another interesting uh, uh, effect is the impact upon the migrant population. Here I uh, analyzed uh, my, the distribution of migrant population uh, in the city center, inner suburb, outer suburb, and remote area from the year 2000, 2005, and 2010. You can see that in terms of the percentage, the percentage of migrant population who took up residence in the central city continued to decline, decline in the inner suburb, but it continued to rise in the outer suburb. What does that mean? It tells us that as a result of hosting macro event, migrant population were pushed out of the city center. They could no longer afford the high-priced housing in the inner city. They have to move away from the inner city to the suburban area. So you ask about who are the winners, who are the losers? The loser happen to be the migrant population. The winners, obviously, is local government and developers. All right, these two cases, one is in the south, the other in the, in the north. One illustrates urban renewal, the other illustrates macro event driven uh, urbanism. These are not isolated cases. Urban redevelopment happened not only in the, Guang, in the city of Guangzhou, it also happened elsewhere. Uh, macro event 
uh, was not limited to Beijing. It happened in Shanghai, the Shanghai Expo. It happened in Guangzhou as well. Uh, this is a graph to illustrate the popularity of hosting mega event uh, as a stimulus uh, uh, to uh, increase uh, uh, urbanism. Okay, so what kind of insights that I could uh, contribute to uh, what the provost just mentioned, that well, this gathering is meant for dialogue, uh, communication, or collaboration. What, so what could I, what could I contribute? Um, I think that in the case of uh, Guangzhou in the south, the emergence of the urban landscape observable today has been shaped powerfully by the reformulation of the state on the one hand, and an increasingly sophistic, sophisticated society on the other. I think that is perhaps something that we could, uh, I, I could kind of The case in the North, mega event driven urbanism in Beijing. The emergence of this fantastic, spectacular urban landscape has been shaped uh, by the interplay of the state well, including the central government and municipal government on one hand, and space on the other. Um, the winners and losers, I already elaborated here, the winners turn out to be local state and developer, the losers happen to be migrants, and of course, landless peasants. Well, many of you said, oh, come on, urban renewal, this, this is not new. <laughs> Arguably, this is definitely not the Chinese invention. Urban renewal, China learned from the West. Mega event, again, is not the Chinese invention, so what's the big deal? I think that the Chinese case does have some interesting elements that, that deserve our attention. First of all, if we think about property rights, economist definition, property rights as a bundle of rights to possess, use, income, and dispose of land. Eh? If we take property rights as these bundles of rights, these four important pieces. Uh, what the Chinese has done in the process of urban redevelopment is that they only change use rights and income rights. They did not change anything in relation to possess and dispose of the land. Uh, they only change the formula concerning who gets what, and not so much about who owns what. Now, theoretically, we can compare the Chinese model with the model of the former Soviet Union prescribed by neoliberalism. But I think that this grassroots level case study could illustrate uh, the why and how these two different models of market reform and opening up are different. Chinese land user seems to be more concerned with exclusivity and less interested in transferability. That is perhaps another thing that deserves our attention. All right, Mecca Yuan, uh, what makes it so special? I think that what characterizes the Chinese practice is the direct involvement of the state as both lawmaker, law enforcer, and game player, and in many cases, user as well, with obvious conflict of interest. Um, now, we tend to take space as a container, and obviously here, reproducing space through hosting mega event, turn space from a container into an important input factor. Input factor. All right, um, may I take my advantage uh, of being the first speaker? <laughs> I realize that this is the beginning of the conference, so please allow me to raise uh, a number of issues uh, that I hope that some of you, if not all of you, will come away with uh, for better discussion and dialogue. First of all, uh, I mentioned earlier that you know, in our existing uh, attempts to theorize global urbanism, 
we tend to place a lot of emphasis on the global scale, horizontal comparison, uh, external uh, interaction. And I think that what the Chinese case has demonstrated is the importance of vertical, internal, and local condition. So I, I put this as a question mark you know, for discussion. Secondary, emphasis has been placed on the effect of the agglomeration economy. When we take a look at urbanism from the global east, do we really need to pay special attention to social and political origin? Thirdly, the relationship between state and market uh, that has been highlighted in the theory of neoliberalism. But what this case from the Far East has demonstrated is the importance of state-society relation. And I already elaborated on states and place. So urbanism of the global east, is that something that could be further developed? I mean, a question for uh, all of us to discuss. Taking into consideration the developmental state, Confucian society, banks population, uh, uh, just proposed urban development, and heterogeneous nature uh, of local culture, and a space that continue to experience transformation. So to summarize, I basically look at two dimensions. Yeah, the first case from the South illustrates the interaction between state and society transforming the urban landscape. The second case from the North, from Beijing, hosting mega event, illustrates the relationship between state and space. Thank you so much. George, one wonderful presentation. We have about 10 minutes for discussion, so we want to open it up to the floor. You can take the questions as you, Thank as you. you please. Okay. I think if you speak up, we should be all right. Okay, oh, well, that's better. Um, Martin Miller from the University of Lausanne in, in Switzerland. Um, I'm interested in what the Global East is for you, and particularly whether you use it as a region or as a territorialized concept, which is the impression I had um, when, when I was listening to your talk, or whether you use it more as an epistemological category. And I'm asking the question particularly in relation to a concept such as the Global South, which I think is confronted with the same kind of tension between uh, territorializing forces, but then on the other hand also the intention to use it actually as, more as a uh, deterritorialized epistemological category. So I'm wondering where, where you fall in your usage of the Global East. Very good, yeah, thank you. Uh, a short answer is I, personally, I tend to take the Global East as a method as a method, as a an, as an perspective, uh, rather than simply as a territory that is isolated, that is different. And uh, I, I think that we take it as a method will allow us to resolve, to reconcile the tension between um, generalization on the one hand and exceptionalism on the other. Uh, I also hope that it could provides a new path to, uh, to resolve the tension between epistemology on the one hand and ontology. You know, if you think about that tension, it basically it, it, it comes from an, our convention to take what we are familiar with and then to compare with something that happens uh, afar. So by taking it as a method, I think that, I hope this will provide perhaps a third way. Yeah. Yes. Or uh, global, um, uh, influence 
-hmm. in local context. My second question is that looking at this diagram, we talk about the relationship between the state and the society and the state and space. What about the relationship between the society and the space? And I don't know if you mm -hmm. have into it. Um, I would love to um, know more about how the local uh, community, how do they, is there any, any room for them to uh, play a role uh, in cleaning the space or negotiating the space for their local needs or local mm -hmm. diversity? Very good. Very quickly, um, the uh, contribution of global capital to Chinese uh, mega events uh, remain relatively limited. Uh, the bulk of capital that has been mobilized are actually uh, mobilized by municipal government through debt. I didn't have time to elaborate the the danger of, of, of looming uh, local debt in China as a result of hosting mega event. And what, what, what has happened in China was the municipal government, again, using this as a justification, um, and use the credit of municipal government to form an alliance with private developers and the goal to do massive borrowing from the bank. And we all understand that the four leading banks in China, they are all owned by the state. So if you go to negotiate with banker, you say, that, well, this is, we have got a green light from the central authority to, to host the, the uh, Beijing Olympic, where we need so much capital. Uh, the, you know, these four major banks, they have no reason to say no. So as a result, it, and, you know, if you believe the result of survey from the IMF, McKinsey, uh, you know, there's a last number of reports produced by uh, this international uh, organization. They suggest that uh, the ratio of debt to GDP in China uh, has now uh, uh, led China to become one of the highest among all emerging economy. 50% or over of China's debt are related to real estate. The majority of local debt of debts are government, uh, a local government, right? And uh, so, you know, that, that is to, to respond to your first question about global capital. Second question, society uh, and space, excellent point. Again, I didn't have time to elaborate. There is this interesting um, um, portfolio of space, society relationship, and even state market relationship among different places, uh, suggesting that the relationship between society and space vary from place to place. So in the case of Guangzhou, the society have a stronger power to influence how space will be reproduced. If you go to Wuhan, if you go to Beijing, as you move from the south to the north, as the legacy and the influence of the planned economy gets stronger, the role played by society in the determination of how space will be reproduced gets smaller. Uh, and that reminds me of the market transition theory uh, popularized by Victor Nee. Um, I think that there's an important role for geographers to come in to say that, hey, there is an interesting spatial dimension uh, for you to revise your market transition theory. So the relationship between society and space vary depending on perhaps you can call path, the path of socialism. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yes. George, thank you for the presentation as always. So I'm interested in this last diagram and this and not so much that there are state society or state space relations, but what constitutes those relationalities? And it seems to me that the two examples you gave us is where state society relationships are mediated through land and, mm. and state space relationships are mediated through finance, specifically debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to tell us a little bit more about that. And what happens if it's not land or debt? What are these other relationalities? that might impact state in society or state in space? Mm, yeah, very good point. Um, I uh, look at um, five important dimensions. Uh, 
uh, you know, to make it consistent. So I look at uh, the mobilization of capital, you know, where capital has come from uh, in this relationship between state and society, uh, uh, who, you know, where and how capital has been mobilized, number one. Number two, I, I look at uh, land, uh, you know, you already mentioned that is the second. And then thirdly, I also look at labor, you know, more broadly population, including the local population and migrant population, uh, and also developers as the important stakeholders. How do they interact? You know, we're talking about the relationship. So how do we measure relationship? How do they interact? Uh, and then finally, I also look at the um, relationship between the economic activities on, on one hand and the natural environment on the other. Uh, again, how, how are these two got, um, got mediated or, or, you know, uh, through this process? Um, you are quite right that um, length and depth, these are not the only two dimensions uh, with which these competing interests uh, of these you know, two um, agents uh, are, are mediated. Uh, there are many other, for instance, uh, employment, uh, residency, uh, because in the case of China, uh, residency is unlike the United States. Here you, you have a full, free spatial mobility. Now, uh, in China, they remain, I mean, mobility has been improved, but it, but it remains a very important factor for their consideration. Uh, and finally, I also take a look at distribution. Who gets what in the end? Uh, uh, the distribution of income and many other benefits. Yeah. Okay, I'm afraid we have to uh, we have to stop here if we want to stay on track. Uh, thanks so much, George, for for a wonderful presentation. I, I think. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say that it, uh, this presentation also underscores that comparative urbanism is so much more than a methodological approach, you know. Uh, we, we have a number of papers in the, in the conference uh, that provide empir comparative empirical analyses of different cases, right, and that's of course very useful. But at the end of the day, comparative urbanism is about, I would say, is about the elasticity or portability of theory. And so you can perfectly have a particular case that seems to be decentered and measure it towards established theory, right? Uh, that, at the end of the day, is, is what it's all about. Uh, we have a short break uh, that goes until 10.30, uh, and so there are refreshments in the, in the lobby, and then we split up in three different rooms, uh, and you can obviously go where you have to go or where you choose to go, and we'll meet up all together again today at, um, what is it, at 5.15 for the keynote by uh, Kevin Ward. All right, so enjoy the day, and we'll see you later. <laughs>